Seven days after being launched into space, NASA and Astrobotics Peregrine Lunar Lander is now expected to return to Earth soon, but in a state of ashes. In an update posted on social media on the 13th of January, Astrobotics said it has been monitoring the trajectory of Peregrine over the last several days. Its Vulcan Centaur launch placed it on a highly elliptical orbit that took out beyond the orbit of the moon, with the original intent of swinging back around the Earth before going out to and entering orbit around the moon. On Sunday, Peregrine was about 242,000 miles, or 389,000 kilometers, from Earth, just beyond the orbit of the moon, which circles Earth at about 238,000 miles, or 384,400 kilometers. Our analysis efforts have been challenging due to the propellant leak, which have been adding uncertainty to predictions of the vehicle's trajectory, the company said in a statement. Our latest assessment now shows the spacecraft is on a path towards Earth, where it'll likely burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. Finally, in the 17th update, the company shared that since the Peregrine Lunar Lander's anomaly occurred six days ago, we have been evaluating how best to safely end the spacecraft's mission, meaning that they are ensuring an endeavor that involves not creating more debris in cislunar space. Working with NASA, Astrobotic received inputs from the space community and the U.S. government on the most safe and responsible course of action to end Peregrine's mission. The recommendation they have received is to let the spacecraft burn up during re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. Since this is a commercial mission, the final decision of Peregrine's final flight is in Astrobotics' hands. Ultimately, the company must balance their desire to extend Peregrine's life, operate payloads, and learn more about the spacecraft with the risk that our damaged spacecraft could cause a problem in cislunar space. As such, they have made the difficult decision to maintain the current spacecraft's trajectory to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. The company did not disclose a time nor location for the re-entry. Independent analysts, using available tracking data, estimate re-entry in late January 18th, near Australia. It's expected to enter the atmosphere over the Great Barrier Reef off the northeast coast of Australia and burn up in Earth's atmosphere. Peregrine suffered a propellant leak hours after its launch on January 8th. The company believes that a valve in a helium pressurization system failed to close after an initial test, causing an overpressurization of an oxidizer tank. That ruptured the tank, creating the leak. While Astrobotic initially estimated the spacecraft would run out of propellant and thus be unable to maintain the proper attitude for its solar panels to generate power, within a couple of days, the spacecraft continued to operate. The company said on the 11th it had powered on 10 payloads on the spacecraft, including four provided by NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services, or CLPS, program. The propellant leak has slowed considerably to a point where it is no longer the team's top priority, Astrobotics said in its update on the 13th. It did not state how much longer the spacecraft could operate with its remaining propellant. I am so proud of what our team has accomplished with this mission. It is a great honor to witness firsthand the heroic efforts of our mission control team overcoming enormous challenges to recover and operate the spacecraft after Monday's propulsion anomaly. I look forward to sharing these and more remarkable stories after the mission concludes on January 18th. This mission has already taught us so much and has given me great confidence that our next mission to the moon will achieve a soft landing, said Astrobotics CEO John Thornton. Spaceflight is an unforgiving environment, and we commend Astrobotic for its perseverance and making every viable effort to collect data and show its capabilities of Peregrine while in flight. Together, we will use the lessons learned to advance CLPS, NASA said in its announcement. Astrobotic is the latest private entity to have failed in a soft landing following an Israeli nonprofit and a Japanese company. NASA had paid Astrobotic more than $100 million for carrying its cargo under an experimental program called Commercial Lunar Payload Services, CLPS. The overall goal is to seed a commercial lunar economy and reduce its own overhead. Though it hasn't worked out this time, NASA officials have made clear that their strategy of more shots on goal means more chances to score, and the next attempt by Houston-based Intuitive Machines launches in February. Astrobotic itself will get another chance in November with its Griffin lander transporting NASA's Viper rover to the lunar south pole. 
Now here's a question that deserves some answers. Why is landing on the moon proving more difficult today than half a century ago? That's correct. It's been over 50 years since NASA landed astronauts on the moon and brought them all home safely. Shouldn't landing on the lunar surface today be straightforward, if not trivial? Hasn't the rocket science of the mid-20th century become the basic knowledge of the 21st? Well, first off, Peregrine isn't the only recent failure. While China and India have both placed robotic landers on the moon, Russia's Luna 25 crash landed last year, literally right before India's made contact on the moon. Nearly 60 years after the Soviet Union's Luna 9 nailed the first gentle touchdown, landers built by private companies have a 100% failure record on the moon. The Israeli Bereshit lander crashed in 2019, while a Japanese lander built by iSpace crashed last year. Peregrine makes it three out of three losses. One fundamental challenge, says Jan Warner, a former director general of the European Space Agency, is weight. You are always close to failure because you have to be light or the spacecraft will not fly. You cannot have a big safety margin. In addition to that, almost every spacecraft is a prototype. Apart from rare cases such as the Galileo Communications satellite, spacecraft are bespoke machines. They are not mass produced with the same tried and tested systems and designs, and once they are deployed in space, they're on their own. If you have trouble with your car, you can have it repaired. But in space, there is no opportunity, says Warner. Space is a different dimension. The moon itself presents its own problems. There is gravity, one-sixth as strong as on Earth, but <laughs> no atmosphere. Unlike Mars, where spacecraft can fly to their destination and break with parachutes, moon landings depend entirely on engines. If you have a single engine, as smaller probes tend to do, it must be steerable, because there's no other way to control the descent. To complicate matters further, the engine must have a throttle, allowing the thrust to be dialed up or down. Usually, you ignite them, and they provide a steady-state thrust, says Nico Detman, ESA's Lunar Exploration Group leader. To change the thrust during operations adds a lot more complexity. And yet, with the first lunar landings back in the 60s, it can be hard to grasp why the moon remains such a tough destination. There were decades when people were not developing landers, says Detman. The technology is not that common that you can easily learn from others. Testing then is critical. But while rockets can be bolted down and put through their paces, the options are more limited for spacecraft. Tests can check whether power and propulsion, navigation, communications, and instruments work, and spacecraft are shaken to ensure they can endure the intense vibrations of launch. But there is no good way to simulate a moon landing. It's much harder to qualify and validate a lunar lander than many other space systems, says Detman. During the space race, NASA spent a staggering 25 billion US dollars on Apollo. It still clocked up failure after failure before it reached the moon, and now with 70 years of institutional knowledge and a culture geared towards designing, building, and testing spacecraft under its new commercial lunar payload services scheme, the agency is looking to slash costs and stimulate the U.S. space industry by paying private companies, such as Astrobotic and the Houston-based Intuitive Machines, to deliver its instruments to the moon. The trade-off is a greater risk of failure, so more lost missions should be expected. These companies are all relatively new, and comparatively, they are doing these missions on pocket change, says Dr. Joshua Rosera, a research associate at Imperial College London. But the strategy should pay off, he says, because companies learn from their failures. It still ends up being cheaper over the total number of missions, he says, even if the first few may crash. Well, folks, that's about it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in, and if you want to support our channel even further, you can hop on over to our Patreon through the link in the description below. Sign up and become a patron today to gain access to exclusive content. Sounds exciting, right? In any case, we still appreciate your generosity and your passion for space exploration. As always, this is Kevin from Great SpaceX, and until next time, keep looking up.